I was enjoying the song. Jenna said, I got to get down front like there's something else supposed to happen. <laughs> Take your copy of God's Word this morning, and we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, it's going to play right into what, uh, what Stormy shared with us through song. Uh, that there is a home that, uh, that we are on our way to, that uh, uh, this world is not our home. Uh, that while the kingdom of God exists here and in heaven, uh, you know, this, we're just sojourners here. Uh, home is a different place for us. This is the mission field for us. This is where we get to tell people about Jesus, and we will talk a little bit about that uh, today. Confidence is a strange thing. Uh, it's great when you have it, and it's awful when you lose it. And some people in San Francisco have lost their confidence in their city government to fix the roads. So a group calling themselves the Pothole Gate Vigilantes have patched more than 130 potholes and raised more than $7,000 via GoFundMe to purchase asphalt and other materials. These individuals were moved by a sense of urgency to make the roads a safer place. They talked about how they'd seen countless blowouts and bent rims and accidents that had happened because of the way the roads were. The city was discouraging this practice, citing safety concerns and potential waste of materials, maybe because of improper techniques. But the vigilantes have vowed to make repairs as long as people keep donating. So over the past few weeks, we've been talking about life hacks here at church, those different things to improve the quality of our lives. Some citizens in California look to themselves to solve a problem that other people would not or could not. But today, I want you to look to God this morning to solve a problem that you absolutely cannot solve. Sometimes there's things that we can do where we get together in groups and we can fix stuff. Sometimes we think that if we're just good enough and people like us enough, then maybe we can fix stuff. But there are some things that we just can't fix, some things that we just can't make happen, and that is where we need to make sure that we look to God. So that's what the life hack's going to be, that we need to look to God and so this morning, I want to encourage you to place your confidence in God because He will not disappoint you. So let's pray. There, Jesus, we do thank you for what's been shared in song. God, we thank you for the prayers that have been lifted up through this time of service, this time of worship. And God, I pray that as we get ready to look at the truth of your word, uh, God, that, uh, that we will see you, uh, that we will hear you. And God, that we will choose to respond to you because I'm just your messenger. And so, God, we ask that you will do great things at this time in this place. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I said, our life hack today is to look to God. We're going to look to God in all things, but particularly in what we're getting ready to move towards in Scripture. So in his writing to the people of Thessalonica, as we have studied it over the past few weeks, Paul has commended them for their choice to turn away from idols. If you remember back in what we call chapter 1, verse 9, you know, he talked about how they had turned away from their idols. See, their life, their life of idolatry, it wasn't satisfying. It was unsatisfying because it had promised so much and left them feeling disappointed and empty. And we've talked about how, well, idols aren't always little graven statues and stuff like that, that if we're going to be honest, we might have some idols in our own life. And we need to be honest and realize, well, they do disappoint. They don't give us what we need. So they found the promises of God to be reliable, good. In his writing to these new believers, Paul praises their commitment to serve the living and true God. Same verse, just a little bit further in. And so they've turned from these idols, these things of failure, and they have turned to the living and true God. Not this false God, not these false things, but the one true God. And so they imitated God and they shared his words because their practice of love 
Their willingness to show some self-control proved advantageous. So they, they didn't want the idols because they disappointed them. But they realized that this God that Paul was talking about wasn't disappointing. And in fact, as they chose to live and serve him, more and more God proved himself to be just exactly who Paul said he was. And so they realized this way of life, it wasn't a burden. And though while we might be weary while we are on this earth, it is God himself who gives us the strength so that we can live life to the fullest. I would love to tell you that God's going to take away all your problems, and he might take away some of them. Maybe he'll take away all of them. But what he does guarantee is that not necessarily that he will always remove those problems, but he's there with us when we go through them, and he definitely gives us the strength we need so that we can live for him as we do go through those difficulties. Can't do it on our own, but we can do it with him. So their lives were noticeably better because following God's ways was better than their own. So just kind of as an aside, can other people see that your life is better because you claim Jesus? Many of us in our small groups, which I talked about uh, at the beginning of the service, talked about a guy named Joseph, and it was obvious in Joseph's life that God was with him. It was noticeable. And so God needs to be noticeable in your life too. So in this writings to these people of this church in this place called Thessalonica, Paul applauds them for their confidence. Because in verse 10 of chapter 1, it says, in looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven. So they were confident, because what were they doing? They were looking for Jesus to come back. Now, as an aside, as a people, we are generally, you know, we talk a lot about turning from sinful things to godly things, right? We talk a whole lot about the fact that God's ways are better than everything else, and it should, we should want to follow them. We don't talk so much about the fact that God's returning and what that's going to mean for us. I mean, that's what they were looking forward to. They were looking forward to God to make all things right. Because, see, right now our world is a hot mess. And we as believers should be able to contribute God's goodness into the world to make it a better place. But ultimately, the only thing that is going to fix the broken world is the return of Jesus Christ. He is going to solve all the problems of injustice. He is going to fix all the heartache. He is going to take care of all the lives that are broken. All right? And so they were excited. They were confident. They were looking forward to the coming of Jesus. They understood that there were some things that only God can do. Only some things that God can do. And so they looked towards him instead of back at what they had been doing. Looking towards God. And so, have you made this choice to turn away from your idols? Think about that. Pocket it away. Are you committed to following God's ways? Think a little bit about that. As we look at God's text today, make that determination. But will you place your confidence in God and trust Him to take care of the things that you can't? Now, that one's a little tougher because that's the future, right? Trusting in God for something that you haven't seen yet. It's one thing to say, oh, I can trust. You're trusting the pew right now that you're sitting in, and so far it has not failed you. That's in the here and now. But, you know, give it two or three hundred years, and I don't know how well that wood's going to hold out for you. Maybe it'll be great. I, I don't know. But the future is a little bit harder to trust in. Can you trust God with what he's going to do for you tomorrow? in the week to come. That one's harder, but we can have confidence in that. So here's what Paul said to the people of Thessalonica to strengthen their confidence. So we've made it back to chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 13. You can see it in your uh, Bibles and on the screen behind me, and it says this, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died 
and was raised again to life, we also believe that when Jesus returns, that God will bring back with him the believers who have died. All right, so we can see we're talking about some future stuff. You know, are we going to trust in God for when life, for our sake, from our perspective, comes to an end? Are we going to miss out on the good things? What happens if we pass away believing in Jesus now that we pass away before his return? Are we going to miss something good? I mean, these are some honest questions that the people of Thessalonica had, and there are going to be some reasons that we look at God's text this morning. And so I want you to know that you can be confident about what you know. What you know makes a huge difference. There's a reason why, as your friend and as your pastor, I encourage you to be in God's Word so that you will know things. I encourage you to be a part of Bible study and worship as a group as we learn so that we can know things because we need to have confidence in what we know. You gave no thought about sitting down this morning because you knew that pew would hold you. Now, some of you were way more cautious as you were walking up to the church house because there was some ice on the ground and you knew the ground was going to be your friend but you didn't know so much about that ice, right? So there are things that we can have confidence in, and we're going to look at that. See, the world then and the world now is filled with speculation, anecdotal evidence. Oh, and we know this word, misinformation, right? But Paul says he wants them to know so that they don't have to be unsure, so they don't have to be anxious about the difficulties of life. Because when you don't know, that's when it kind of gets scary. See, I'll tell on myself a little bit. Uh, it's been a long time, or it had been a long time since I had been to the dentist, all right? Now, as a kid, I went to the dentist all the time. Uh, I, I had braces, and so, I mean, I, I had dental work, you know? Uh, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, up until just recently, I had had zero cavities, and so I had never been through that. And so Jen and I went to the dentist after too long of a time, and, and the, the dentist said, you've got just a little bit of spot there. Now, my, my daughter Paige, who's you know, going to be a dental hygienist, said, well, you had a pre-cavity. So I'm not calling it a cavity. I'm still saying I'm cavity-free, but it was going to become something problematic. And so he wanted to do a little bit of resin filling. I'd never had that done before, right? And so I don't like needles and I don't like the poke. You know, you know where I'm going. And so I'm just not a big fan of that. And so the more I could have known about how that event was going to work out, the better I would have been. It did not turn out quite the way I expected it to. I was thinking one shot, just a little bit of time, and we'd be good, and uh, it was not. There were three and just a little bit more, and uh, all in all, I did all right, more or less. Uh, but uh, if I had known going in, I think I would have been just a little bit better. And so having confidence is good. See, many people... When it comes to that which is unknown, well, we struggle. Many people struggle to explain death. Let's be honest. Do we cease to exist? Do our earthly deeds matter at all, the things we do here? Do you still get to do things in the afterlife? What is that like? I mean, and so since Paul says he wants them to know then guess what? There are answers for these questions and questions like them. The word want here reveals that we don't have to wish for understanding because God offers it and intends from us to benefit. So God has given us his word throughout the countless ages that we can trust, that we can know, and that we can rely on because he wants us to know about the past. He wants us to know about the present that we live in, but he also wants us to know about the future and how we can be confident and have a hope. 
He wants us to know. No secret knowledge here. You don't have to be a member of First Baptist Church for a year before you start getting the good knowledge. All right? God wants us to know all. But not just that. The word know itself declares that God wants us to be certain rather than willfully ignorant, succumbing to speculation and to misinformation. So God wants us to know. God says we can know. He even says we can understand. Now, I'm here to tell you, though, there's some stuff in Scripture that's still a little bit of a mystery to me. But, man, I keep going because I know God reveals what I need in the time when I need it. And so we can be certain. Well, so... Do we cease to exist when we die? I mean, that's a question that some people have. That's some things that some people believe. Paul says the believers do not have to grieve like people who have no hope. So this word grief here, it means to be in distress. It means to experience deep emotional pain, pain that sometimes you can actually physically feel. You know what I'm talking about? There are emotions we have that actually cause us to hurt, and many of you have felt stuff like that before. This pain, it's real for everybody. To those who have no hope, to those who are without Jesus, without his salvation that he offers, this pain has no comfort. This pain has no resolution. In fact, all you have as someone who doesn't know Jesus is maybe the numbing effects of time that maybe as time goes on, it might not hurt as much. Or what you're banking on is that there's some merit-based justification. And so, okay, I'm experiencing this grief and this loss, but maybe if this person did more good than bad, then maybe it's all going to be okay. You know what I'm saying? We justify it and think, well, they had a positive impact on me, and so I can take something good from it. But to those who have hope, All right, why do we have hope? Those of us who know Jesus, who have accepted his offer of salvation, well, there are certainties that provide comfort. There are certainties that bring resolution to this pain because this word for grief is likened to the pain of childbirth. Now, I can make a joke and say, well, yes, we've been pregnant twice. And my wife's already back there shaking her head saying, no, I knew it was going to come. I said it anyway. She's been pregnant twice, right? All right. Well, the pain of childbirth, as it has been related to me, a mere male, uh, is painful. It's painful before. It's painful after. But then something amazing happens, right? Right? baby. And when baby happens, baby does something to transform that feeling of pain, right? Baby does something that's amazing, even to the point that after baby, women sometimes want more baby, right? Even though they remember it being painful. And so this word is likened to childbirth in the fact that as believers, we do experience grief, pain, hurt. But God, as he works in her life, transforms and does stuff so that there's something new that's birthed, something that happens. Why? It's because of these certainties, certainties that we know about what comes next, things that we're getting ready to look at and talk about. So this word hope, it provides this certainty because it describes a sure expectation, a guarantee, a a promise of faith. This certainty helps with this pain of grief because it provides these answers that I was talking about. We don't have to speculate. Do we just disappear? Do we cease to exist? Because here is what we know. This is what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 14. In my father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. 
Other scripture says to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord and that he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Now, promises, certainties from Scripture that let me know that when I pass and when my loved ones pass, they don't cease to exist. No, those believers are where? Well, where are they, in fact? Well, we know that they dwell in heaven, with Jesus in bodies that are like the transfigured or resurrected Jesus. That's a certainty that we can know. There is comfort in that, that when we experience loss, we know that those believers who have gone before us are in the presence of God in heaven in something that is amazingly new for them. That helps us with our grief. But man, it certainly prepares a place for them, doesn't it? And so that's truth that we need to know. Well, how about that other question? Do our earthly deeds matter? The way that we live life in here and the things that we go about, do those things really matter? Because Paul says, we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again. And so to many, what is done on earth is the only thing that matters. They hope that by doing more good than bad, that they will leave some sort of earthly legacy that means something, or that their actions will balance out some sort of eternal consequence and eternal reward. We've heard people talk about that. Well, I'm not a bad person. You know, I think I've done more good than bad, and I think that, well, you know, the man upstairs, he's going to be okay with that. Man, I struggle with the term man upstairs, period. But nonetheless, that's the thought that a lot of us have, right? And so we think that there's some sort of cosmic weighing of skills uh, about our actions. But Scripture tells us this. It tells us that the wages of sin is death. That means that our deeds, your deeds, the things that we do here, that's what brings death to us. Okay, that the wages of sin is death and that we are sinners and we bring about our own death. All right. But some people say, hey, I don't think I've done anything warranting death. Right. Because in our mind, there are sins and there are sins right? And there are to some degree. There are certainly some earthly consequences to some sins that are worth, worse than others, all right? Absolutely. But when it comes to sin, you know, Scripture tells us, man, that we can keep all but one of the law, you know, and we are guilty of how much of it? All of it, all right? So even if you did one of the little sins, I mean, consequences eternity-wise, same, right? So we see that. You might not think that that's fair, but that's it. Scripture tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not some, not most, not just you, maybe me, all. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. In fact, if we want to bring a little bit of ranching and agriculture into it, Scripture tells us from the prophet Isaiah that all of us of like sheep that have gone astray, turning to our own ways. I mean, in man, so we are. He even goes a little bit further and says that even the best things that we do, the best day of your life is like nothing but filthy rags to God. So the best you have to offer is the stuff that you use to wipe the grease off the bottom of your truck. All right, and so do our earthly deeds matter? Well, this is why Jesus tells us, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So therefore, we need salvation, which is offered by Jesus and is secured by what? his death, and his resurrection, because no matter of good stuff done here is going to get you into heaven. We read that in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. 
And this is the way I likened it. If human effort can get you to heaven, then some of you will make it and some of you won't. Why? Because some of you are strong and some of you aren't. Some of you are smart and some of you are less smart. Right? If it's based on human ability, we're in trouble. Because human ability here on earth, it's different, right? I mean, there are great athletes and then there are me. Right? And so, I mean, we just got to keep up with stuff like that. So... To those who believe Jesus' death and resurrection is the only earthly deed that has a legacy of overcoming consequences and the promise of a forever reward, all right? That's us. That's what we believe. Paul's use of the word believe here means to be persuaded to act. In fact, this word for believe that we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the Greek word for faith, a belief that you put into action because you trust it, all right? So he's telling us that we are to believe that those who are persuaded by Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave are saved through faith. That's what we believe. Jesus experienced separation from God as he took our death upon himself, right? The death we deserve, all have sinned. He took that upon him, our death upon himself. But this is what, that's what he did at the cross. But at the resurrection, what did he do? He gave us his life to make us alive. Take our death, gave us his life. And that is the important part of Jesus' death and resurrection for us. Okay? It's because of that that you and I, who know Jesus, will be able to stand before God in his presence. This is why Scripture says that Christ died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Paul even says it a different way here. For God made Christ who never sinned to be our offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. All right? So when it comes to the fact of our earthly deeds, accepting God's gift of salvation is the only earthly deed that matters because it's the only earthly deed that overcomes death. Think about that. Do our earthly deeds matter? One. One earthly deed. Now, are we supposed to live in a life, that, a way that honors God? Absolutely. Are we supposed to redeem the time? Absolutely. But when it comes right down to it, that is the one most important thing about all things. So do we cease to exist? Well, no. Those who know him are in his presence. Do, do our earthly deeds matter? Yes, they do. One, and one earthly deed alone matters. So that gets us to the last thing this morning as we kind of try to start wrapping stuff up. And is, so, do you do things? What, what happens beyond? What happens when we step into eternity? Paul says, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Now, that sounds like a kind of a cool purpose, right? That means, man, God's going to, he's given us a purpose. We're going to get to do something. It's not that we're just kind of, eh, floating around, doing whatever. Because, see, there's great speculation that takes place after death. Some people believe you work out your issues, maybe in a place like purgatory. Try to figure it out, work it out, end up becoming better than what you were when you got there. Some folks believe that. Some believe that you inherit some sort of angelic role, right? You float on the clouds, you get yourself a little harp, maybe wings, maybe you do special things for God. I don't know. Maybe you become someone's guardian and you guide them through life. Some people kind of think that. Some believe well, that you start over as someone or something else. Not mocking, 
There are folks that believe that and lots and lots of other stuff, all right? Those who reject the gift of salvation. Now, now pay attention. This one's kind of clear. Those who reject the gift of salvation choose punishment for themselves. So everyone's going to stand before God. There's a purpose. But those who reject God choose punishment. We think God punishes. Well, God came so that we may have life and have it abundantly, right? All right? And so we say, by rejecting God, bring me all the punishment. And so that happens. I mean, that takes place. They are held accountable for all their actions. They are eternally separated from God. All right? Now, we make lots of jokes about what it must be like and how we're going to be okay, but there is no way to work out of this situation. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you are standing before God in the presence of eternity, all is done. There is no bargain. There is no working it out. There's no freedom to party with all of your friends because Scripture tells us that it is a place that you are going away from God that is going to be utter darkness, and it describes it as weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and that sounds way worse than the grief that we talked about a while ago. So there will be no, I'm going to party with my friends. Not just that. There's not going to be a second chance. Jesus talks about it. I mean, because he basically tells them, he says, you know, you didn't believe before. I sent you the prophets. I, I, you know, I sent you others, and you don't believe. What makes me think that if I send you back, other people are going to believe because of you? There are no second chances. Now, that might sound harsh to you, but on this side of eternity, when you don't know him, it's set. But on this side, the earthly side, how many chances, how many opportunities, how many people, how many preachers, how many church services, how many whatever, that if you truly wanted to know the God of creation as you looked and as you see what's going on out there and realize that it's beyond you, you could have had him. And so that's what waits if you don't know him. But those who believe, okay, they inherit the kingdom of heaven. They don't earn it. They've inherited it. God provides it. So what does the scripture tell us? You are heirs with Jesus. Oh, that's cool. You will rule with Christ. I like that. You are complete for all eternity. To me, that's like the hits keep getting better, all right? On one hand, not so much. On this, this is good. And, and just to be clear, in heaven, you know, we're not like angels. Scripture tells us that angels are lower than us, all right? And so we don't have angelic duties. That's what God has angels for. They are messengers, and I personally believe that we don't concern ourselves with the things that take place here on earth. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that there is heaven, that there's no weeping, you know, right? There's no sorrow, that there is no pain, that the lion will lay down with the lamb, right? That we will be complete. And so I have to believe that if I'm in heaven, I'm, I'm rocking it up there with my Savior, right? I'm enjoying this new body and however it works with the people that are there that have gone before me. But if I'm there and I'm looking down, it's what's taking place on this blue marble that we used to have called home. Even on its best day, would there not be things that we would see that would totally break our heart, that would consume us, that would hurt us? And so I don't think we're concerned with what's here because we're concerned with the one who is up there. But Paul says we're going to come back. Why? Because we're going to help fix the problem. I mean, so we're going to fix what sin broke. Now, we get to participate with the one who's going to do all the fixing, but we're there on the team, 
right? I mean, it'll be like when you're, you're the janitor for the NFL team and you get the ring right along with the star, star quarterback, right? I was there. Yeah, I'll take that. So therefore, those who believe and have already died, we are going to be reunited and we are going to get to advance the work of Christ. And so that helps with grief too, because I know I'm going to get to see people again. And I'm not just going to get to see people again. We're going to get to do stuff. How does all that work? Well, that's part of the mystery I don't have all the answers for. But nonetheless, the concept is there, and that helps. Listen to these words of Paul as he finishes out this passage. In verse 15, it says, We tell you this directly from the Lord. Pay attention. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and first... The believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And so verse 18 almost is like a, so encourage yourself with these words. So encourage yourself with these words. Grief here is real. And it hurts. But what Paul is sharing from God is that there are certainties that you can know that will help you, that will set the course of your life, that will impact you here and will impact you for eternity. I've preached lots of funerals. Some way more pleasant than others. In every situation, I do my best to provide comfort to the family no matter what. But when you know the one whom you're there to celebrate is in the presence of God, it's totally different than when you don't know. God still comforts. But what Paul is telling us today is that you can know you can know about you. You can know about those who've gone before so that you don't have to grieve. And today, I'm just going to lay it out. Maybe you need to spend some time and let God do some work in your life to save you so that you are not the source of grief for the people that you love. Kind of a backwards way of saying you might need to be saved. But yeah, so, encourage each other with these words. Many in Thessalonica had made a choice to turn away from their idols. They did towards God. They committed to serving the living and true God, and they possessed confidence in God as they were looking forward to His return. So, here's where we're going to bring it all. A place where we get to make some life decisions. Have you chosen the gift of salvation that Jesus has offered? It's the only thing you can do on earth that's going to make a difference. And so, if you want God to save you today, that can happen. Scripture says today can be the day of salvation. I'm going to pray in just a moment. If you want to be saved, come forward. Let nothing hold you back. Because I'm here to tell you, you might think, oh man, that's embarrassing. And I'm here to tell you, everybody in this room is going to be totally excited that you gave your life to Jesus because we've done that too. And man, what a day. Let it be today. Have you committed your ways to God? You know, the things that you do in Jesus' name here and hereafter are the only things that are going to matter. Make sure that you're spending your time in a way that makes a difference. Are you looking for ways to help others, to serve, to minister? You might say, I don't know what that looks like or how to do that. I'm going to stand here. I'd be happy to pray for you and help you find what that might look like for you. We'll try that together. Maybe you'll try something and say, oh, that's what I've always wanted to do. And maybe you'll say, oh, I tried that and that's not quite for me. But hey, is there something else? Yeah. 
Lastly, do you have confidence that God will do everything he says? I want to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes this morning. We're going to have a moment of invitation. We will experience pain in this life. We will experience loss in this life. But God not only promises to help us with our grief, he promises to be with us in all that we do. So trust God as you live life. Three questions, three answers, but the most important one is the one I started with. Choose God's gift of salvation. Don't let today pass that by.